this morning. Whatever your agenda you came this morning with, I encourage you right now to surrender it over to God and tell the Holy Spirit, have your way this morning. Whatever you came to teach me, whatever you came to show me, I know, Holy Spirit, you are here. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people and his people are here giving him praise, giving him glory, and giving him adoration. If you thought you were coming to some dead, boring place, go ahead and change your mind. There's no, there's no God in the empty tomb. Why do you look for the living among the dead? For my God lives. He is arisen. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we came to give a jubilant praise this morning, a praise of victory. For we are the victors. You're the winner. You're the head and not the tail. You're favored. You're marked by God. You're called by Him. And so we give praise this morning from a place of victory. I don't care what your life has been like. I know what the Lord is like. And the rest of your story is different than the last part of your story. So I thank you, Lord. Have your way. Do your work, Lord. Save the lost, Lord. Heal the sick, Lord. Give faith. Thank you, Jesus. Before you take your seats, I want to tell you my title for this morning to set the, the pace of where we're going. It's this, faith takes guts. Faith takes guts. And let me tell you something. There's a, people want the Christian life and a life of faith that it should be buttoned up and pretty and look nice and you, 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 your kids always obey. and. You always got a job and you always got plenty of money and everything's good because I follow Jesus and I'm just blessed and blessed and blessed and it always looks like that and I don't got no addictions, I don't got no skeletons, I don't got no problems, but I know what faith is like. And there's a faith that takes guts to worship and sing with your okay voice that don't sound like no voice of an angel and you don't care what your neighbor thinks. There's a faith that takes guts to share Jesus and you don't care who likes you or doesn't like you because you know that Jesus is the one who saved. There's a faith that takes guts to believe that your kid that's doing drugs is coming home to serve God. There's a faith that takes guts to say, I know it seems like it's on the rocks, but I know this, that my house is built on the rock, Jesus. He's the cornerstone. He's the capstone. No one can shake what I built on Jesus. I got guts. I got guts, a faith that takes guts. Everybody don't like a faith that's got guts. There's something to it on the inside. It's not hollow, it's not empty, it's not thin. There's some guts on the inside of your faith that are willing to hang on when others let go. It takes guts to pray for an impossible prayer. It's a faith that takes guts to believe when it seems like there's no hope. It's a faith that takes guts when the doctor who's educated and paid well and looks poised and together comes in and gives you the report that you don't want. And you look at that report right in the doctor's eyes and you say, I do not receive it. It takes guts. It takes guts to read the Bible What's in the Bible, really? Read it and say, I'm gonna live that out. 
regardless of what anybody thinks. It's a faith that takes guts to tithe for the first time, to tithe for the 1,000th time. It don't take any guts. Offense, but no offense. It don't take any guts to tip $5, $50, or $100 whenever you feel like it. Whenever you're feeling good and you're around, oh, I'll give 200 bucks, okay, that's great. Give 50 bucks, give five bucks. That don't take any guts. That's you doing what you want. You want ice cream, you go get ice cream. You wanna give, you give. It takes guts to say, God, 10% of anything that touches these mortal hands shall go back to your kingdom, no matter how broke, no matter how rich, no matter how hurt, no matter how faith-filled, no matter how lie, no matter how low, no matter what, 10% of anything that touches my life goes to you, God. And I encourage you this morning, that if you haven't been, then start now. Because you don't wanna go through a time of a low economy, everything's 75 times what it should be. You go to get a free ice water, and they're like, it's 10 cents now. You go get a $7 hamburger, they're like, it's $17 now. And if you want cheese, it's 18. If you want pickles, it's 19. You can't pick all the accoutrements anymore because they don't come with it. They're at all, you want two pieces of lettuce? $27. Listen, but I know something that some people don't know. I know something you know. That I lift up my eyes. That my help does not come from this land. That my financial prosperity is not based on economy, who's the president, or what the government's up to today. My financial prosperity is based on the one. He is Jehovah. He is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. I give him what he says and He blesses me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. He provides for every need that I have and has me overflowing in every good thing that I might be blessed to be a blessing. And you're gonna learn if you, if you start, if you will start and stay committed to tithing, not tipping, tithing, you will learn that it always brings back blessing. Every time, every time. I encourage you this morning, whether you've been giving or not, make a start today. Make a statement of faith today. We sow our tithes and our offerings, not in too authentic, but through authentic into the kingdom. This is a launching, this is a base and a launching pad for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The people who go here and sow here, go preach the gospel outside these walls. We love to give and be generous and many are blessed because of it. So I thank you in advance. You can go online at authentic.church if you wanna give online. You can go on Cash App or you can go on Venmo. You can give on either one of those platforms. There's a giving envelope in the seat back in front of you. You can take one of those giving envelopes and you can put your tithes and offerings in there and you can put that in the giving station in the back of the room. And I know this that every person giving by faith shall be blessed. Every person giving with guts shall be blessed. I wanna pray with you right now for every giver that's in the room, whether you already gave before this week, because some people give, maybe you got paid on Thursday, Friday, you gave. Or whether you're giving right now, regardless, if you're a giver, if you're sowing into Authentic City Church, would you lift up your right hand this morning? I wanna pray a blessing over you that's gonna change your wallet, your bank account, and your capacity. In Jesus' name, Father, I thank you. We're not here to be broke, we're here to be blessed. Not because we're making it up, because you decided it over our life. And so I thank you, Lord, for a blessing to flow on and in and through every giver in this room. That we would have great capacity to do what you've called us to do and be able to say yes to be blessed and to be a blessing. I'm not afraid of prosperity. I know you're the God of prosperity. And so I thank you in Jesus name for making abundance land into the life of every person in the room and online with their hand lifted high. We pray this in Jesus name and everyone that prayed with me says, Amen. Amen. You can take your seat if you'd like. Praise God. We are in a collection called indoctrination. Somebody say indoctrination. And the job and the assignment during this time is to rewire our minds 
from, from thinking through a lens of the world around us and to put our minds, like the word says, we renew our minds through the word of God that we can put our minds set on the word. That whatever the word says is the lens we want to think through. So I unashamedly invite you into this time where we're saying, Holy Spirit, have your way, that the word of God would indoctrinate us or even brainwash us into thinking what the word says we should think and not what the community around us implores us to think. Because the community around us wants to, wants to sell to us take from us and keep us down. But the word of God wants to fill us with faith that we would rise up higher and higher, or as the word says, go from glory to glory. That's why I say faith takes guts. Because most of the time, whoever's in charge really doesn't mind and isn't offended if you call yourself a Christian. There's a lot of people that call themselves Christians and don't live by faith. You can call yourself whatever you want. You can call yourself purple if you want. It doesn't make you purple. So just walking around saying we're Christians, we're Christians, the devil's fine with it. The world's fine with it. The community's fine with it. The schools are fine with it. Just don't live by the word that Christians are supposed to live by and it's all gravy and cool. But if you wanna live out the faith that's inside this Bible, it starts ruffling some feathers and then you have to decide, do you care more about what God says or more about what they say? Does God get the first of your money or do you worship the mortgage company first? The mortgage company don't provide for you. Does God get the first of your money or Wi-Fi? I remember when Wi-Fi was a luxury. It was like, you could have it, you could not. Do you plug it in your computer or do you not plug it in? It's like, oh, we don't know, you know, like, but now it's like, if you don't have Wi-Fi, you don't even, you don't even live, you're, you're dead. Like, what does that mean? You don't have Wi-Fi, like. Like, you know, oh, no Wi-Fi here? People, every, everywhere you go, it's like, Wi-Fi passwords up on this stuff. We just living off that stuff. I'm living off the word keeps me connected. Wi-Fi or no Wi-Fi, I don't even care. I'm living off the word. If I can search it or not, I got unlimited data anyways. I'm like, why are you guys concerned about Wi-Fi? Everyone has limited data now, pretty much. I mean, like, it's not 1999. You're not like free nights and weekends anymore on your flip phone, you know? I'll call you after nine o'clock. It's not, that's not it anymore. You can call whenever you want now, you know? You don't get 10 text messages anymore. You get a lot of text messages. 10 seemed like a lot, though. At one point, it's like, I got 10 text I can send. That's going to last me for a month. Now you're like 10 texts is one minute. Are you here? Where are you at? Are you here? You're close. Turn left. Like you, 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 you know what I'm saying? Like takes guts. Faith takes guts. Takes guts to speak the word. Takes guts to live by the word. Takes guts to pray for the impossible. Takes guts to believe for your children. Takes takes guts to have that kind of faith that says, I'm willing to be different, ostracized, not care what someone else thinks, but I'm going to live and care what God thinks first. It takes guts for me to, for me to give my money into the kingdom of God. It takes guts for me to stand firm on the things that I believe in. Even when someone else is saying an opposing view, I don't have to just nod my head and smile. I can voice out what the word of God says about it. It takes guts for me to talk to other Christians and remind them that everything that's in the word is for today, that signs and wonders are for today, that speaking in tongues is for today, that healing is for today. It takes guts to stand up for what you know is right in a world that is fine with everything being wrong. In a world that celebrates debauchery and miscommunication of sex and breaking down of what is holy and what is good and breaking down of marriage and breaking down of the family unit and saying, hey, yeah, smoke what you want, drink what you want, go where you want, do what you want, just have a good time. Your truth is your truth. Your way is your, tra your way. It takes guts to say, no, Yahweh is Yahweh and the way is the way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no one like him. There's no book like this book. There's no word like this word. And when God says it's going to happen, can't no man or woman or child stop it from happening. His word will come forth. Yeah. Takes guts. Yesterday, 
I rode 101 miles on my bicycle. Thank you. It was a 100 mile race. To my surprise, there was actually a 101 mile race, which I don't know why they did that to me. I felt like 100 was plenty and fine. So I don't know why I needed one more mile, but apparently I did. So I rode on this bicycle on this little tiny seat, 101 miles in the heat, in the sun. And let me tell you something, it took guts. Cause I trained and I hydrated and I practiced and all this stuff, but it just, it takes faith just to get on the bike first place. Like, I don't feel like, oh, riding a bike is easy. Okay, let me just tell you, Riding this bike ain't easy, man. It just, it wants to fall over all the time. And on top of that, if you notice, if you see the pedals, they're very tiny and my, my feet are clipped into the pedals. They're locked in there. So I don't know if you've ever ridden a bike where your feet are locked into the bike. But the guy told me when I got the pedals at the bike shop, he was like, oh yeah, man, have a good time. You're gonna be way faster now, you know, da da da, drag and stuff. And I was like, I don't know what you're saying, smart person. And you're nodding your head because you're like, yeah. But he was like, you know, just get ready to fall. And I was like, oh, no, I'm not going to. Listen, dude, you're, 20, you're 23 years old. I'm not 23. I'm not going to fall. Like, my fallen days are behind me. I'm in my 30s now, and I, I, I try to never fall. And he's like, well, <laughs> everybody falls. I said, well, not me. First time riding the bike, I fell. So, <laughs> yeah, your feet are locked in. So, I mean, that just... Just riding it alone takes faith. And a faith with guts to get you across the finish line at 101 miles. But it's like life, you know. We started out, we were in a big group. It's early in the morning, it's not hot. It feels great outside. It's cool, 78 degrees. We were on our bikes. We were all like, yeah. Let's go, it's great. We were talking like, yeah, where you from, man? Oh, cool, yeah, you're looking good, I'm looking good. We're all looking good, you know? There's a big group of us, about, about 40 of us in this pack. We got the Peloton going, everyone's pushing everybody. Ah, yeah, yeah, we're going like 22 miles an hour, we're flying, but it feels like nothing, man. It's just loose, it's good for 40 miles. At 40 miles, people started dropping, because it gets hard. Because you trained and you hydrated and you're ready and you're with the group and they're encouraging you. But all of a sudden, like, you start getting that leg cramp in your, in your, in your leg. You're like, ah, I don't know. See, when you come and you're, you're 40 miles, you're at, you're at church, everyone's jumping, everyone's excited. This is great. I love God. This is awesome. Then you go get in your car and your wife says something kind of sideways to you and you're like, you know what? Da, 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 da. And you're like, oh. Faith takes guts. Then you go to work on Monday and you're running late and your boss is like, hey, you're late. And you want to like tell them off because you're late. But you're like, you're actually the one who's late. Like, you don't get to tell nobody off. You're late. Like, that's just the facts. Like, be on time. But you're going to be all bent out of shape and have a sideways attitude the rest of the day and like have some whatever. See, it's all cool at 40 miles and everyone's having fun and we're in it. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you where the guts hit because at 40 miles, like the group starts getting more thin and people start falling back. But let me tell you, at 75 miles, the sun is out. It has fully said hi to everyone. There's no shade. It's hot. You're on the black top, man. It's just, everything is just hot and you're sweaty and you, you're out of water and you're like, what's going on? And at 75 miles, that's when the group started to fall apart. There was, there was 8,000 riders that rode, they said, the 100 miles. And Michael told me this morning, 1,500 finished. There was 15,000 riders for the weekend. Our group started off with 40. By the time we got to the 75 miles, we were down to 20. It was like a sniper was just shooting them off. Where's Ron? He's gone, dude. And you don't know, these aren't your friends. It's like who you're riding with. I remember the, one of the guys was like, hey man, where's Paula? And I was like, bro, she's at 40 miles back. 
Paula didn't make it, bro. I don't know her, but she didn't make it. This is life. This is faith. There's those fun times where you're like pedaling and it feels so awesome. You're not even working hard. Then there's the other times where it's like you got to put your guts into it because there's no Bible school, no theology, no training, nothing getting you further than where you are except for your faith that has guts to do what the Word of God says you can do. And you got to decide in your mind that it's going to happen. When we started off, we were in a little group, like I said, 40 of us. It was actually about 75 that we're all planning to. And you got a piece of tape on the back of your helmet, different color. And I was in the B group. And so I got a little piece of yellow tape. Some people were starting off and they got two pieces of tape. One for the B group, one for the C group. Guess who were the first people to fall out of the group? Two tape. Those two tapers, gone. You know why? They had an option. They gave themselves an option. They were like, oh, you know what? I'll ride with this group as long as I can. And, and then when I can, I'll drop back with the other group. They had options. Like, listen, I'll live for God as long as I can. And when I can, I'll go back to the club. Like, I gave myself options. Like, I don't, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I think I'm gonna serve God. I think I'm gonna tithe. We'll see what the money's like when we get there. I think it's gonna be good. I think it's gonna work out. But I'm giving myself options. Like, I got options when I start. If you got options when you start, you got failure when you finish. If you decide now, you're gonna get across that line at the time and patience you want and you're going to see good stuff happen. You're going to see the fruit of God from your life. But if you think now, like, oh yeah, yeah, I got options. I got no options. I'm all in. Indoctrinating myself to the things of God and choosing that this is the faith that I shall live by. It is life by faith and my faith takes guts. And when it get hard, I just tell myself, don't stop pedaling. Just keep going just a little farther. Just keep going. Don't quit now. It may be hot, but the finish line is near. It may be hard, but you'll keep going. I know your kids seem far off, but God's doing his work. I know the money's low, but God is the God of provision. I know your hope is seeming low, but he's the God who gives hope. He's the God of all hope. I know it seems like it's broken, but he's the one who can repair any heart. I know it seems like you're down all the way, but he's the one who can bring you up. Have you not read in my word? I put your feet upon the solid ground. I bring you out of the mud and set you where you need to be. I know by faith I shall keep going and not quit. Am I preaching to the right place this morning? I rode 101 miles to get across the finish line. Pour my guts out. And there's so many of us in many times in life we're like, oh, this is just the time to coast. Like we don't gotta go to church right now. We don't gotta give right now. We don't gotta serve right now. This doesn't matter. Like, oh, we'll do it later. We'll do it later. You're putting off what God is saying to do now. You're having two pieces of tape on the back of your helmet saying, I got option A, I got an option B. And you got to remove the options. Let your guts out and let your faith go and decide that my faith is my life and my life is my faith. There's no separating the two. If you want to separate Mac from Christianity, you can't. If you want to separate Christianity from Mac, you can't. If you want to pull faith out of me and get the non-version Christian of what's, you can't do it. There's only one version. I sold out and indoctrinated myself, my family, my wife, and my life to the Word of God. That's the only way to live. So how do you get faith? If you turn in your word to Romans chapter 10, I'll show you. We're studying in this, in this collection called Indoctrination. We're studying the book of Romans. And on Monday nights, we're studying it verse by verse. So if you want to come tomorrow night right here, we'll have a Bible study and a dinner at 530. We'll feed you in the word. We'll feed you in the flesh. And then after that, we have prayer at seven. But at 530, we'll study the word of God. I think we're on chapter two or three of Romans going verse by verse studying that book. It's been really good. If you're wondering like, how do I study the word? I don't know. I really know how to read the word. Come one time. You'll come and learn to read the word. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith, someone say faith, faith. comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Faith comes, meaning we get faith by hearing what? 
the word. You don't get faith by hearing the world. You don't get faith by hearing a talk show. You don't get faith by hearing DIY videos. You don't get faith by hearing what, hearing what happened in the political realm. You get faith by hearing the word of God. Every person that's a believer in this room has a measure of faith. And it is our job, not God's job, it's our job to grow and to steward that measure well that it might be more than we were given. It's our job to do it. To get around with our ears to the things of faith that we might grow and learn and be stretched. That means you wanna be around people that are talking faith. So when you say, when, you, when you're just casually talking to your friends and you're like, oh man, I'm just not smart. I can just never learn stuff. They say, wait, what you speak matters. You gotta get your words aligned with the word. Like, oh yes, that's right. When you're with your friends and you say, man, I'm just a loser. They say, no, you're not a loser. You're more than a conqueror, says the word of God. You gotta get around people that speak faith so your ears can hear faith, so your life can live faith. Otherwise, your faith will be dead and have no guts. You'll get to mile 75 of your marriage. You'll get to mile 75 of parenting your kids. You'll get to mile 75 of your job, of your legacy, of your life, and you'll think, you know what? I'd rather quit. Because I'm sitting there and I'm peddling and it's hot and I got dropped from my group and I'm kind of by myself for a while. And just to really encourage me in this moment, on the side of both sides of the road, constantly are people that have given up and they're just laid on the ground like they're dead. Their bike's on the ground, they're on the ground. They're not looking up. They don't care anymore. Some of them crawled to the shade. Some of them didn't, they're just, they're just out. That's my encouragement as I'm going, oh man, oh man. And then to make it even better, there's, there's trucks and trailers coming up and down the roads, making sure those people don't actually die loading them up in the truck and trailer. And so they're coming by, these people are all gave out, their, their bike's there, and they're like half waving at you. Like, they're like, you're next, buddy. And I'm like, don't stop pedaling, don't stop pedaling. It's just like your friend who says, oh, you know what, she's gonna leave you anyways, just do whatever you want. It's just like your friend that says, oh, you know what, kids are just how they are, just don't worry about it, just live your life, you can't worry about that. It's just like your friend that says, oh, God doesn't need your money, that's just the preacher trying to be all this and that, you can just do whatever you want with it. It's your friend trying to tell you, your, your neighborhood, your community, trying to get your ears tuned in to what the devil has instead of what the Word of God has for your life. And then you're wondering, why am I calling myself a Christian and living for the world? You won't see any fruit. You won't see goodness and mercy following you all the days of your life because you're not living for Jesus. You're living for friends, fans, and popularity. You're living for yourself. You're living to try to figure it out. Instead of saying, this life is living for Jesus, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Now, when I put the word on, I hear the word, my faith starts to grow. My mindset starts to change. My speaking starts to change. I start to know I can do it. I will be it. I do see it. I know God is with me. Even though others have left me, God is always with me. He is near to the brokenhearted. He bottles up every tear I have and he turns those tears back to joy. Whatever I sow, I reap. And I reap more than just one time. I reap many fold. 30, 60, and 100 times. So Lord, I thank you by faith I give. I thank you by faith I give my time, I give my energy, I give my strength. Even when I sow into my kids, I'm giving. And so I thank you, Lord, for giving that energy back to me. I'm declaring God's word over my life because my ears are tuned in to faith. It's growing my spirit. That's why some are depressed, but you're walking around with joy. Of course they're depressed. They've been at home binge watching reruns of Desperate Housewives. That ain't gonna get you, that ain't gonna get you no faith. What's that show that everyone was watching for a while that had these kids in California and they were on the beach? Some, what was it? I don't know. You know what it is, tell me. Say it, you don't have to, you don't have to admit you're watching it. I know you know what it is, tell me. What? Jersey Shore, that'll work, that's fine. <laughs> They're all the same. They're all the same. People doing nonsense and we're binge watching it, wondering why we fight with our wives afterwards and why we wanna spank our kids unnecessarily, why we're yelling at people at work, we're, why, we're, why our money's going down instead of up, why our faith's going down instead of up. It's like, oh look, because just like faith comes by hearing, death comes by hearing. 
You hear faith, you start to rise up. You hear death, you start to go down. This is it. Depression has a destination. And the destination is to kill, kill, sorry, kill, steal, and destroy. It is to take you down instead of you going up. It is the plan of the deceiver that he can just get in and just tell you how bad off you have it, how you're the only one, how nobody sees you, how nobody likes you. Depression begins to build. Anxiety begins to come. Stress begins to weigh you down. Now you're thinking, man, I need to take medication to get out of this. You don't need medication. You need the medication. You need the healer, Jehovah Rapha. You need the God, the true God that can heal you. You don't need some pill to take you from this place to that place. God will take you to every place you need to go. Faith comes by hearing. And when you've been hearing, you live by faith. There's no way around it. It's impossible to hear faith and live a different way because it changes you. If you have the spirit of God inside of you, it changes you. This is why I tell people, you got people that you love that aren't living for Jesus, you just get around them and have all the fun that you usually have living in the Holy Ghost. And they're gonna know that you have a better time than they have. They're gonna be jealous and wanna have that kind of time. If you got friends around you that aren't coming to Jesus, it's because you're acting like them when y'all hang out. You start acting like you when y'all hang out, they'll change just like that. They only got two choices, leave or change. I don't have any real friends that want to go out Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night to the club and drink. Because I don't go to the club and drink. So we cannot be friends if that's what you like. Either they're going to change and be like me or they're going to leave and go be like them. That's the only choice. I'm not changing to be like them. There's no other option. Those are the options. I can love them. I can pray for them. I'll, I'll, I'll bless them. I'll give them a miracle handkerchief. I'll partner with them. But we're not going to, I'm not going to the club to be their friend. Like, oh, you know what? Like, sometimes you got to go where they're at. No, sometimes they got to come where I'm at. Sometimes they got to come and hear the faith that I'm speaking. Let it change their life. Let me tell you why it matters. If you jump back a couple of verses right there, we just read Romans chapter 17. You jump back to 14, just a couple of verses up, you'll read this. It's talking about, it's writing to a church in a place, telling this, this church in Rome to stand firm for the things of God and reminding them how many people need the gospel of Jesus Christ around where they are. Encouraging them that they're in this influential city, which I believe in DFW, we are in an influential city to change good by the power of the gospel. And it writes, and it says this in verse 14. How then will they call on him, talking about Jesus, whom they have not believed? Let me tell you what it's saying. If you don't live by faith, then how will the people who need to call on God know how to call on God if they don't see you calling on God? If God's not your real savior, then how will they know what it's like to call on God and be saved? If they don't hear you going to the rock bottom on the way down, you know, my life is spiraling out of control. I just don't know what to do, but I know the one answer is to call on God. And then when they see what God does in your life, they're gonna say, wow, that works. I wanna call on God. Then it says, and how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? How are they going to believe? How are they going to become Christians if they haven't heard the gospel? If they don't see how you call on God and they don't hear how you share the gospel, then how will they know? And that's the problem that we're shifting right now in the church. And you can feel it in the atmosphere of what's happening right now. We don't need any more training on how to share the gospel. We don't need any more training on how to, how to break down, how to follow Jesus, how to be a disciple, how to be discipled. We need people to model it and do it so the generation behind us can watch and say, that's how dad shares the gospel at the grocery store. That's how I share the gospel at the grocery store. That's how dad shares the gospel when he's at work. That's how I share the gospel at work. That's how big brother does it. That's how I do it. I got two boys. They're about three and a half and one and a half. But the one and a half year old is really like three and a half. Because he does what brother does. Whatever brother does, he does. That's it. 
He don't care. If brother can do it, he can do it. If brother runs, he runs. Brother jumps, he jumps. That's just what it is. He knows nothing else. And he probably won't for a while because he's watching his brother. He's doing what brother does. That's how we are. That's how God made us to be, to watch him and do what he does. And he has given us brothers, mothers, fathers, and sisters around us that are older than us, that are supposed to be living a life sold out and on fire for the gospel. It says, and put the word on your forehead, put it on your hands, put it on your doorpost. So when you go out, you see it. When you come in, you see it because that's when you're blessed both ways coming in and going out. So the generation before you, they know the stories. They know the testimonies. They know how granny was healed. They know how granddad was saved. They know how Papa came to Jesus. They know the stories and they're living in that same legacy of faith. And if you say, oh, I didn't come from a legacy of faith, start one. Start one. Don't let no one else say that in your family. You start it now. You shift it now. You change it now. Well, I came from a legacy of we had to hear someone say, I don't, won't share too many details, but we had to hear someone say like, talking the other day, mom, about such and such disease runs in their family and how they had to go and get checked because their dad had this disease and da 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 and like how their kids are gonna have the disease that runs in their family. I was just about to throw up on the floor. I was just, I was literally, I'm, I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna puke right here, on the, if I gotta hear this any longer, this person enslaved their whole family into this disease. Listen, I don't care if cancer used to run in your family. You can make a new decision today. You can make a new declaration today. You can take all the guts you have and decide by faith, cancer does not run in your family, cancer runs from your family. Find somebody else. Devil, go crouch at another door because you can't have this house. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. So go have sickness and depression, knock on someone else's house because right here, we're saved and filled by the Holy Ghost. We're not walking by this game of what the world has, we're walking by what God has. We know there's a new way, a new place, a new plan. It says, for I have come that you may have life and life abundantly. The devil came to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come. I don't have a spirit of fear. I live by faith. How will they know how to call on God if they don't see anyone call on God? How will they know how to believe in God if they don't see anyone believing in God? And then it says, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? You see the shift? How will they call on God if they don't see it? How will they believe if they don't see it? But then it says, but then how will they preach if they're not sent? You know what it takes? There's a cost to sending the gospel to go forth. There's a cost, like there's a cost of, of our emotions. There's a cost of our grit. There's a cost of our time. There's a cost of our dollars that someone might go and preach somewhere. And he's writing here because he's already said, and will say again and call the church in Rome to be a base and a sending out of people. To send out. And Paul's hoping that soon, he hasn't been to Rome, he's hoping soon he'll come to Rome when he's writing this. And from Rome, he's hoping that he'll launch from there and be able to take the gospel to Spain. That was his hope. And he shares that with them. We want the gospel to go forth. We don't want to do any work. As long as someone else does it, someone else pays for it, someone else funds it, we're good, gospel. You don't, you, Christians don't care. They're not against the gospel going out. They just won't, don't want to give their life for it. The problem is, it says that our bodies are a living sacrifice for the gospel. We're already called to give our life for it. In the last week and a half, I've had three different ministries ask me, can I come preach a week revival for them? One in Brazil, one in Colombia, and one in India. Can you come preach for us? When can you come? And I wanna say, now, we're going. I'm boarding the plane. Is that too soon? Is it good? You need next week? But how can they go preach if no one's funding the gospel to go? How can they go preach if no one's sending them to go preach? 
They're going to get on fire. They're going to get the Holy Ghost inside of them. They're going to get the anointing of God. And they're going to say, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. And you're going to say, okay, just sit here and open doors. That's your job. Opening doors is just a portal for the next thing you're going to do. Oh, go serve on the parking team. Serving on the parking team is, is just the, the practice and assignment for what you're doing next. It's the parking team all week. All week you're the parking team. What are you doing? Preaching the gospel. What are you doing? Winning the lost. What are you doing? Setting the captives free. Everything that we do, I don't care what you do. I don't care if you're on the phone with your doing insurance claims. God bless all of those people. If you're here and that's your job, I will give you a miracle handkerchief today. Because that's just got to be tough, you know. I don't care if you're bagging groceries. I don't care if you're holding the door. I don't care if you're on a computer inputting data. I don't care if you're driving a forklift. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is that you do. You're preaching the gospel. And we have to catch the vision for what the word of God has. How will they call on him if they don't see you calling him? How will they believe in him if they don't see you believe in him? How will they go preach if they don't know you can send them to go preach? How will these things happen? And then it reminds us at the end of verse 15. And it says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Someone say, those are my feet. You don't need a microphone. You do not need a microphone to preach the gospel. You do not need a stage to preach the gospel. You don't need a megaphone. You don't need a social media following. You don't need a YouTube following. All you need is a faith that has guts to say, I'm going to preach wherever God sends me to preach. I'm gonna go from the crummiest job, to the best job. I don't care what it is. I'm here to talk about Jesus. He's the one that saves. That's what we're called to do. And you may not have to hop on a plane to go to Colombia, Brazil, or India. That's, that's my assignment. Your assignment may look different. You may be preaching to two-year-olds. You may be preaching to eight-year-olds. Thank God somebody does, because I was a two-year-old and an eight-year-old. You may be preaching to your kids at home school by yourself and no one's watching and nobody cares and there's two kids there. It don't matter what it is. You do your assignment, what God called, and you do it with a faith that takes guts. John Maxwell's a famous author. I've read a lot of his books. If you haven't read one of his books, I would encourage you to. There's not a, a bunch of authors that I'd suggest very openly, but he's definitely one. He writes books on leadership. That's why I love him, because I knew from an early age God was calling me to lead, and I wanted to be a good leader, and I want to be a good leader, so I started soaking up as much leadership material as I could, even when I was a teenager. I started reading his books. I remember when he, he told a story, I got to hear him speak before, and he told a story about how when he first started writing, his publisher read his manuscript and sent it back and said, hey, it's too specific. You can't just write about leadership. Nobody wants to hear that. You gotta have a more broad audience. And he really contemplated, should he change what he does or, or not? And he decided that he's supposed to write on leadership. And so he started, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with what I'm, what I'm called to do. I'm gonna write on leadership. And has now become the greatest voice in the nation, maybe the world, on speaking on leadership. And imagine if, when he was younger, if some publisher who would have told him, hey, you should switch what you write about. And he would have changed what he wrote about and been some mediocre writer that no one ever heard instead of a multi New, New York Times bestseller that's written over a thousand books. Sometimes people giving you advice, they don't know what God called you to do. And it may not make sense, but it makes sense in God's kingdom. And we'll listen to people's advice. The guy who gave him that advice don't write no New York Times bestsellers. He publishes books. You think he knows something, but he don't have your call. And you'll hear people's advice that makes sense, but it's against what God said. Always go with what God said over what makes sense. Sometimes they align and sometimes they don't but always go with what God said. So anyways, John Maxwell, he, he wrote a book and in one of his books, he has a quote and the quote goes like this. I think it'll bless your life and speak to the fact that faith takes guts. It says, in order to do anything new in life, anybody wanna do anything new in life? You want your life to be any different than it is right now? You want your kids, family, wife, job to be any different than it is. You want any more dollars than you have right now. You want any more house, car. You want any more dreams. 
Is there anyone in the room that has any more vision for the life of what it currently is? You, 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 you're not ready to die yet. You have something else to do. A little bit more breath in your lungs. He's writing to any person that wants to do anything new in life, whether you're riding 101 miles or whether you're never riding 101 miles, anything new. Somebody say, I'm gonna do something new. In order to do anything new in life, you must leave your comfort zone. Your comfort zone is where the old new stuff was. And there's like five or six or a hundred other comfort zones behind that. But when God calls you, just like he called Abraham, to go and do his assignment, you have to leave the zone that you're in and go to a new zone. And if you knew what was in that new zone, it would also be a comfort zone. The fact that you don't know what's in that zone is what makes it an uncomfortable zone. The fact that it is uncomfortable is the only thing that takes faith to go into that zone. There's no faith in your comfort zone. You know what's there. Your house is there. Your mediocre stuff is there. You're trying to pay your bills is there. Your marriage is there. You, you know what's in the comfort zone. You go out, you got your boys night, you got your girls night, you got your this and that. You got your softball team. Hey, we got a softball team coming up. Thursday nights, if you're interested, come find me after this, okay, plug. You can be terrible, we don't care. We're just trying to hang out with the fellowship of the Lord, okay? You're like, I can't hit a ball. Great, you're gonna fit right in with about half the guys that are on the team, okay? I can't run, great. Bunch of guys can't run, don't worry about it. Don't tell them I said that, okay? You got your routine, this is your comfort zone. But by faith, the Spirit of God is calling us to take a step out of our comfort zone into the unknown, that our faith might be stretched because in this new zone, there's new life, there's new blessings, there's new miracles, there's new provision. In the new zone, there's a new job, a new place, a new authority, a new spiritual gift. In the new zone, there's, there's new favor, there's new anointing. If you, if you leave the comfort zone and you'll go where God is calling you, you'll see the new that he promises in his word. And you're saying, oh, but I've tried it, it didn't work. No, because you're trying to do this from over here. God, that's my calling. There's my blessing. There's my favor. There's my family. There's my anointing. There's my spiritual gifts. There's my influence. There's the preaching the gospel. There's the discipling people. That's where I preach and people get saved. You see it, it's there, but you stay here. You're like, oh, I see it, it's there, but I like this comfort zone because it feels good. You want to feel good? I want you to feel good. but more than I want you to feel good, I want you to have faith. More than I want you to be comfortable, I want you to be powerful. You can have comfort, or you can have power. But sometimes you can't have both. And if you want your power to level up, your comfort has to go down. You have to decide, I'm willing to work a little bit harder, press a little bit more, and take one more step into what God called, because I'd rather be powerful, anointed, and walking in favor than be comfortable, lazy, and apathetic. I know at one point, this seemed like a lot, and this is where I was really thriving, because I started way over there, but now I'm here, and I'm looking to what's next, and I know where God is calling me, but it feels like I'm being pulled from the back like I can't leave. But you have to decide, no, I don't care how hard I'm being pulled from the back, I'm walking to the front because God has called me more than a conqueror, blessed, favored, anointed. I am the one. I'm going to show the world. This is how we call on God. You're going to show the world. This is how we believe on God. You're going to show the world. This is how we preach the gospel and send people to be preaching all over the nation. Thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions will be saved because you got a fire inside of you and decided, I got guts to my faith. I'm not living boring. I'm living outside my comfort zone. I don't wanna hang with no comfort zone Christians. I wanna hang with, with spirit filled, all the way to the top bubbling over Christians. I wanna hang out with 
faith takes guts kind of Christians. I want to hang out with Christians. They got so much prosperity and blessing on their life. They're like, here, take this, do that, do this. Why? Not because they're showing, not because they're trying to do this, because they're anointed by God. Your life will be blessed because you decided I'm not going to be in comfort. I'm going to be in power. And when that happens, the anointing gets on you and begins to move through you and everything you need will be taken care of. Think about this. We don't have a big problem when an 18 year old gets up and testifies. By the way, if you've got a testimony, we do testimonies every Monday night at prayer time. Come share your testimony. We would love to be encouraged by that. We don't got a problem on Monday night when, a, when an 18 year old stands up and says, I'm going to college. It's really expensive, but God covered all my school and I got a full scholarship. We're all like, yeah, praise God, praise God. Because they're young and we're excited. But then an adult stands up and says, I'm so blessed. I just got a new salary, $750,000. I've been tithing for the last 10 years. What a blessing. We're all like, you don't need all that. You should give half of that to the poor. I only make $25,000. And you know what we're doing? We're being indoctrinated to the things of the world, to this poverty mindset saying we gotta stay broke and stay down because that person better not have more than I have. That's too much, that's excessive, that doesn't work. What are they thinking? They should just, they, they're, probably, they're probably living for the world. They probably don't even live for God because if they did, they would never have that much money. See, we got it switched up because the 18 year old said, I got a $250,000 scholarship because God is good. But when a, seven, when a 60 year old says, I'm making 750,000, we're like, oh, they're corrupt. Why's it gotta be? Why can't we just accept that God wants to bless us and make us a blessing? Why can't we just accept that God is actually a good giver, that his word says, have you read his word? I've read his word, it's pretty good. I've read his word and it says, don't you know that a father gives good gifts? Well, I want a, I want a good gift, I got a good father. Haven't you read the word? It says, and whatever you ask in my name, you shall have it. Haven't you read the word that whatever you, whatever you pray, you pray by faith, like you've already received it and it shall be yours? Haven't you read the word that by his stripes you are healed? Haven't you read the word? I've read the word, you've read the word. You gotta put your faith to the word with all your guts on it and say, God, I'm going all in on this thing you call the Bible. I'm saying if it's in here, it's for me. I want it, I'm gonna have it, I'm gonna walk in it, I'm gonna teach people how to call on it, I'm gonna teach people how to preach it, I'm gonna teach them how to believe it, I'm indoctrinating myself to the things of God. Someone say, here's my declaration. You ready for my declaration? I'm leaving my comfort zone. Bye. You can say it all week long. As soon as you start feeling uncomfortable, your faith starts stretching, you're walking in the grocery store and you see the, the man kind of limping and you're thinking, I can pray for him, he could get healed, that's what the Bible says. And then your comfort zone says, dude, why you gotta be weird? Just say out, you say right under your breath, I'm leaving my comfort zone. You walk right over to him and you start getting words out of your mouth, I don't care what they are. I don't, I'm not, I don't even know about yeah. it. Jesus, just get him out. Imagine Abraham. God says, because you read the Bible before Genesis, Abraham, you know that stuff. If you haven't, I can tell you about it afterwards. He says, Abraham, I need you to leave where you're at. I need you to go to a new place that I'm going to show you. He promptly says yes and starts to leave. He ain't got no map, guys. He's like, okay. He don't know where he's going. Then he gets there, he's like, I'm pretty sure this is it. And God's like, nope, keep going. Like, okay, all right. Which direction? I guess that way. Like, what, what's telling him where to go except for God? There's no map, read the scripture, read the story. There, he doesn't know where he's going, that's the point. You're out of your comfort zone and now you don't know, but you have what? You have faith. And it's by faith that God works. Someone say, I'm leaving my comfort zone. Would you stand up with me? Hallelujah. 
I'm gonna invite the worship team up on the stage and we're gonna celebrate right now leaving of the comfort zone and the celebration of new life through baptism, amen? A lot of us in the room have been baptized. Maybe a lot of us haven't, but I want us to celebrate that together. And then I'm gonna give opportunity in the room for any person that wants to follow Jesus to decide to follow Jesus. If this is your first time being part of a baptism, these two young ladies that are getting baptized today are about to express outwardly what's already taken place on the inside. On the inside, they've been made new. And now they're gonna express it from the outside. Like it says in the word of God, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, the old is gone, the new has come. On the inside, that has happened. And now through the, the submersion of water as a symbol of cleansing, and then the coming up as a symbol of the resurrection of Christ, they're gonna show that they are committed, that they are by faith following Jesus through water baptism. And this is Aaron right here. Hey, what's going on, are you excited? Here's what she wants to share with you this morning, that after having a medical emergency, which young people aren't supposed to have in a medical emergency, and then being laid off from work and from her job, she started to pray. Some things, sometimes in life, stuff doesn't seem fair, but even through what seems fair and what seems hard, God is always with us, and prayer is always the right place to turn. I'm so proud of you, Aaron, for turning to that. And when she turned to that, she had a dad that was right there with her. That's her dad standing next to her. I wanna encourage the parents in the room that when you live by faith, your family knows it. I wanna encourage the moms in the room that when you live by faith, your family knows it. The people around you are watching, both your spiritual kids and your DNA kids. We're all raising children around us. The teachers are raising kids all day long. Who they are changes who the children are. You know it because you've been in those classrooms. Aaron, who knew about the things of God, she knew about God, made a decision that I'm all in for God. I know he is my savior and made that decision. Now, she has a new outlook on life and fear is gone. Someone say, I do not have a spirit of fear. Now her life is brighter because of Jesus and Jesus alone. Her mind is settled. The Holy Spirit is in her and on her and has changed her heart to have a heart of compassion to those who are around her. These are just some of the things that the Holy Spirit will do when you decide once and for all to give your life to Jesus. Aaron, we're excited for you to celebrate with you and excited to be around you in this next season as you declare that your life is in Jesus. So we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Be raised up in new life. This is Alexi. This is what she wants you to know. Yeah, thanks for clapping for her. She's just enough, right? You should just clap for her anyway. She's gonna need a story. Okay, here we go. At a low point in her life, she made a decision to go to church with some friends. You get around faith, guys, and you start hearing it. She was so impacted in the worship that she couldn't stop crying. God was just moving through her made a decision to give her life to Jesus. And she's making a declaration today saying, I'm ready to learn, I'm ready to grow, and I'm ready to take God's word seriously. 
Her trust is fully firm in Him and she cannot wait to see what God will do. She has been freed from depression, anxiety, and her whole life has been shifted because she decided to follow Jesus. I've never met her family, but I assume this is her family right here with her, celebrating with her. I'm excited if one of you wants to be on the other side, you can help dunk her there under the water. Dad, if you want to do that, you can. We'd love for you to. Alexi, as our sister in Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May the joy of the Lord be on you. Thank you, Lord. Come on, give God some praise this morning. If you're here this morning and you have not given your life to Jesus, don't go one more step. Make today your day. It is only because God sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross and His blood poured for us that we might have relationship with the Father, that we might dance, shout, have joy, have peace, get to baptize in Jesus' name. It's only because of that. And if you are here this morning and you are not sure where you're going when you die. You're not sure if God hears your prayers and you want to make a decision to follow Jesus. We want to celebrate that with you today. I don't care what your past has been like. Jesus' arms are open today to receive any son or daughter returning home. If that's you and you want your life to be changed forever for the better, on the count of three, I just want you to shoot your hand up wherever you're at. If you're in the room, anyone in the room, one, two, three, anyone in the room, you want to give your life to Jesus. Anybody? Okay, I love you. Maybe I'll see you tomorrow night. Pastor AJ, you want to close this out? I'll give you my mic right here.